Alright guys, this is a long plane review for Spy Hunter on the Amstrad CPC. Released by US Gold on their Kicks budget label, we assume around 1989, but no full price release, and more on that later. Anyway, this is a conversion of a very famous arcade coin-op title released by Bally Midway in 1983. And everything about the game was cool, from the James Bond inspired gameplay of that memorable Peter Gunn theme, to the arcade cabinet with its futuristic yoke controller for a steering wheel, to the decals, the marquee and even the advertising material, it just all screams 80s cool. And boy was this popular and a big hit. Certainly the James Bond feel helped and the game designer George Gomez has confirmed that 007 was indeed the influence after he spent a trip to Japan listening to an audio cassette of James Bond music. Now along with Tom Leon who had worked on the Tron coin-op, they designed the game and they hoped that this could indeed become a James Bond game with a famous Bond theme music, but sadly they couldn't get the license with it being too costly. So instead we got Spy Hunter with the equally memorable Peter Gunn theme music. So as we uh, uh, get into the arcade version here, just so we can take a quick look and compare it to the Amstrad one after, on the face of it, Spy Hunter is just a simple top-down view driving game. However, it's so much more than that. Your G6155 interceptor car is initially equipped with just a machine gun. However, by driving into the weapons van, you can receive weapon upgrades like smoke, oil and missiles to take out the pesky mad bomber helicopter that starts appearing later in the game. It's ironic then that Spy Hunter, being inspired by James Bond, had the weapons truck idea later stolen for an actual James Bond game when the Spy Who Loved Me appear on the home micros from Domox seven years later in 1990. But one of the really cool things about this game is at some point you get warnings that a bridge is out further up ahead so you drive your interceptor off the main road into a boathouse and it turns into a speedboat an obvious homage to the spy who loved me so <laughs> even further ironically referring back to the spy who loved me again but anyway uh, this was a really striking game in 1983 for many reasons mentioned previously. Some may say it's a lot of style over substance, but this is still 1983 and really early days for arcades. So you need to remember context here. Personally, I find the game overly difficult. The number of weapons and buttons a bit overwhelming, and changing into high gear results in a ludicrous speed that is barely manageable, often resulting in death within seconds. Now this can be quite off-putting for new players. However, it's nice that they have a timer at the start of the game where you can die unlimited number of times, which is a clever touch, which will help uh, new players get their feel of the game. And after repeated plays, I found, for example, that, sh that you should use the high gear sparingly to overtake or quickly get out of sticky situations. But guys, video games were tough in the 80s. Oh, and uh, this spawned a disastrous pseudo 3D split screen arcade sequel in 1987. Less said about that, the better though. And it uh, faded into obscurity. Um, the Spy Hunter name was later revived in the early 2000s for a new game on Xbox, PS2, GameCube and Windows that was fully 3D. Um, I had it on the Xbox and thought it was okay, but I remember I got bored of it fairly quickly. Um, it did well enough though to get a sequel in 2003 and yet another reboot around the same time for the PlayStation Vita and Nintendo 3DS. So we move on to the Amstrad version and as you'll see here we only have the box art from the Kix budget release. Now Kix was the budget label arm of US Gold who re-released their full price games on it for pocket money prices. So where's the full price release? Well it never got published on the Amstrad CPC, only on the Kix budget label and two compilations. One being History in the Making in 1988 and Coin Up Hits in 1989. Plus also a French only compilation called Arcade World also in 1989. So what happened here and why was this never released at full price? Well, I've been speaking to the actual coder of the game, Sean Pierce. 
and more on him later. But I did ask him about this, but sadly, as I feared, he had no idea why, or indeed, that actually happened. As he explained to me, he was just a programmer, and the owners just came back, contracted fixed price conversions from US Gold and Ocean primarily, and I knew very little of the deals and licensing. We just put details into the screens as requested. So sorry, no idea about the releases. We were just conversion factory drones working on release after release with very little idea of the commercials in those days. So unfortunately we don't know, but is there anything we could find out for ourselves? Well, as you'll see when we boot the game up, there's credits on the loading and title screen for Amsoft and not US Gold, um, who had the license and released it for all the other home systems under their name. So we could probably conclude that this was destined to be released by Amsoft. At the time, Amsoft and US Gold had an agreement where Amsoft could release some of their big games on the Amsoft Gold label to help boost sales of the Amstrad CPC. Two notable games this happened to in uh, Beachhead and Raid Over Moscow, both released in 1985. But by 1986 rolling around and Spy Hunter was in development for the CPC, Amsoft were winding down their operations. Amsoft hadn't been a commercial success for Amstrad and had outlived its original purpose of getting lots of games and software on shelves for the release of the CPC in 1984. By now, the team in charge of Amsoft had been banished to, to a forgotten office in the Amstrad headquarters and were slowly being wound down. My guess then is that the license and agreement for Spy Hunter from US Gold was made in 1985, but when the conversion was finally completed in 1986, Amstrad decided it was too costly and they didn't care about Amsoft anymore. So it went back to US Gold, who decided to bizarrely um, do nothing with it. Maybe their own license for Spy Hunter from Bally Midway had expired and they too decided it was too costly. Or maybe both parties thought the resultant game wasn't good enough. Although the latter is unlikely seen as the game is kind of okay and both US Gold and Amsoft shoveled out a load of old tut anyway. But enough about that, let's get into the actual Amstrad CPC long play at last. So guys, as you can see and hear, uh, we are loading up the official tape version of the game. And uh, I'm gonna speed the footage up here so we're not waiting ages for it. Uh, but I wanted you guys to see the uh, loading screen. And also I didn't want to use a cracked dump of the game that's been put on a disc file. Uh, the game already has enough bugs. I don't want to take the risk of introducing more issues. But what's really cool on this loading screen is there's a countdown timer. And um, I, I, don't I, I don't remember any of the cassette games having this. And you know how long you've got till it loads and you can go off and make a cup of tea and get a biscuit or something. Um, but yeah, a really nice loading screen uh, with the Amsoft logo there. Take note. And Sean reckons this was done by F. David Thorpe um, for him. And we're nearly loaded. Quite a f relatively quick load this one. And I'll keep quiet. For it's the Peter Gunn theme. Amsoft there. And program by choice. And there you go guys. That is it. That is the only time you will hear the, the famous Peter Gunn theme in the entire game that made the arcade original so memorable. That's it, even when you have a game over and start over again, you don't hear it at all. So we may add our own music later in the game, but now we're just choosing our joystick and we're gonna choose the expert level here because we like a tough challenge on this, cha on this channel. And I just like the craziness that occurs with so many cars on the road bashing into each other and flying off in explosions and other stuff. So off we go. Um, yeah, it's nice and colorful. Um, sprites are okay. Um, we've got a vertical scroll on the go there, which is kind of okay. It's not the smoothest scroll I've ever seen uh, at the f highest frame rate, but uh, the cars actually move, uh, the car sprites actually move very nicely uh, around the road there. They don't sort of 
move across in jumps or jitters or anything like that. So Sprite's pretty good. Um, obviously, it's going to look pretty basic when it's a top-down racing game. There's not much you can do about that, especially when you're fighting against big chunk of pixels. Oh, here's the appearance of the first weapons van or truck. And there we go. Now, normally in the arcade version, you'd get the Peter Gunn theme music playing here. Uh, but sadly, doesn't start, unfortunately. Um, so I don't know why... And that was missed out. I don't think um, Sean remembers, sadly. Um, but yeah, I actually coded um, some music when I was growing up as a kid. Um, I think when I was about 11 or 12 years old. And I actually did my own version of the Peter Gunn theme. So at the next time, I think, yeah, I think we'll do it. I think we'll do it. At the next time we get to like a weapons truck and go in it and get the weapon, I'm going to play my Peter Gunn theme music for you guys just to liven up the long play a bit hope you don't mind but anyone that wants to see the full long play without that music or me talking over the top of it please ask in the comments and i'll upload it as an unlisted video for you ah here's the next weapons van and i believe this should be the oil pickup no it's the smoke i, I would have thought oh meant oil <laughs> never mind um so we've got the smoke there and to switch between the weapons, um, you have to press the space bar, which is a bit annoying if you're playing on a joystick and relaxing back in your chair or something. Maybe you'd, maybe you'd have to sort of lean back and have your foot on the desk and use your toes to hit the space bar or something. Um, but there you go, that was the smoke in action there. Now, there's the first um, boathouse there. You can actually take that and it will move you to the next section and it would save quite a bit of time and possible deaths. But I'm going to follow the game as it would be in the arcade version where you have to wait for the detour warnings. Oh, ran out of the smoke already. So the weapons run out very quickly in the Amstrad version, which is a bit of a shame, especially the missiles, because the helicopter, when it comes, just keeps coming and coming and coming, and eventually you run out the missiles fairly quickly, and you're left stuck, not able to uh, down the helicopter, or the mad bomber. So there we go. We had the turn left signs there, which meant there's a bridge out, ahead, a bridge out up ahead. There's the bridge that's been destroyed. And we've gone to the boat house, so and we're now in the, um, I guess it's a speedboat. And just shoot everything on the river, basically. But just watch out for the blue boats, that they will drop uh, mines behind them. Um, and just watch out for the turning on the right. You want to get out the river as quickly as possible, so you can progress to the next section and level. Should be uh, next, next turning, I think. Coming up here. Yep, yeah, there we go. And off we go. Now, it pays to go quite slowly into the boat houses. If you go in them too fast, sometimes you actually crash, unfortunately. First bug, I should probably mention there. Ah, here's the weapons truck, and we've got some oil here. Excellent. Now, I forgot to mention, guys, there was a timer counting down there, and if you crash whilst the timer is still active, you can respawn as many times as you want. But now the timer has run out. You see that I've only got one spare life by the um, white interceptor there in the bottom middle of the uh, heads-up display. But you can actually gain more lives by amassing a score. I think it's every 10,000 points. Now, if you shoot an innocent or they crash off the road, your basically score um, accumulation stalls, just like in the arcade version. Even if it wasn't your fault like there, those two crashed into each other and uh, went off the road and your score stopped uh, totaling up. Basically, you want to shoot the blue cars that have the sidewinder thingies there, that will slash your tyres. And they look like um, blue vans or something like that. You can't shoot them. I'll show you one. There's one. You can't shoot these guys, but you can knock them off the road by bashing into them or knocking them off with oil or uh, smoke. So there's the first two enemies, essentially. Here they are again. So the light blue car is a pedestrian. Um, 
and the red car is also a pedestrian so try not to shoot them because the more score you get as you see I went over 20,000 points and got a second bonus life there and there's a missile truck you can actually blow up the missile truck and other weapon weapon vans if you want to um, but Feel free to destroy them or pedestrians if they're just they're getting in your way and there's a chance of you crashing. Now I'm making this look quite easy, but this is actually a very, very, very tough and frustrating game, especially especially if you get uh, in a situation where um, you're really near the side of the road and you've been knocked and you when you get knocked your speed goes down and you find yourself in a very very tough situation then. Right, two things have happened. One, we've moved to a new section. Three things have happened. A new enemy. Two new enemies. I think that's called the Road King. The guy, uh, the big blue van there, shoots um, a shotgun blast out of the side of him. And also we have the helicopter there. And when the helicopter comes on, and if you've got the missile pickup, uh, the weapon selection automatically selects the missile for you. So you don't need to hit the space bar for that. So thank God. Here's a helicopter. Yeah, and it automatically sets the missile, and then you can blow the helicopter up. And the helicopter just keeps coming and coming. The other thing that happened is we've moved to the next level. As you can see, the background has changed from green grass to a yellow colour. So maybe we're in a desert now or something. This is a desert highway. Who knows? Um so we are going to base this game um, essentially doesn't have any ending just like the arcade version it will loop forever and ever um, but I think there's about sort of four or five I think five areas in the game I think it may be the fifth area where it like loops around again so basically guys the long play today will be one full loop of Spy Hunter without crashing or dying but okay I was just talking about some frustrating things um, and I was talking about when you get hit by another car it, that, you actually lose speed so if you're fighting against a car and you're right near the edge of like the road or something like that trying to it's really hard to sort of accelerate away and not get stuck in a kind of a bashing battle with the other car and eventually either getting knocked off the road yourself or another bad guy comes up from behind you because you're going too slow and that is an often a common cause of death in Spy Hunter and it can be incredibly frustrating um, there's no gears in the game. Uh, you either go fast or slow using the up and down on your joystick. But I think that works fine. We don't need a separate button for gears. Um, uh, one strange thing is you can only fire one bullet at a time. Um, as you just saw there. The arcade and other versions, it's basically the, the, the interceptor shoots out a whole big stream of bullets and you basically have to wait for your bullet to finish its travel, its course, either to an opponent or off the screen before you can shoot again. So you have to pick your shots wisely. Now I could have gone off the road there and that would have saved me a lot of time because it would have taken us on, on further into the game. But now we have to do another sort of loop of road here before we get the, um, the, bridges, out, the bridges out up ahead and turn left symbol. But we're trying to play it as close to the arcade version as possible. This is what I'm talking about, guys, when you get stuck in a little battle there. There's an exa little example of it happening there. Could have been a could have been a loss of life there. There's the turn left signs. And so basically, yeah. One level of the game is basically you travel down the road. Um, when you get to the first boathouse or the second one where the bridge is out, you then have a water section then you have another section of road and then you move on to the next level essentially um okay um let's talk uh, let's talk about the let's have a bit of a making of the game and as i mentioned earlier guys and as we've already quoted from him i've been chatting to sean pierce the actual programmer and coder of this version of spy hunter on the amstrad and i want to really thank Sean so much for taking the time to talk to me. It really has gone in depth, even though 
he says he admits he can barely remember anything from back then, let alone his work on Spy Hunter and the Amstrad. But let's get into it then. So Sean was working for Choice Software in Northern Ireland and Spy Hunter was likely his first job for them. He then went on to do Platoon and Mutants via Choice for Ocean Software. Around 1988 he left Choice for Palace Software and left the gaming industry around 1992. Um, from speaking to Sean, uh, he remembers he enjoyed making the conversion and, and had a lot of fun doing so. Um, but he wasn't given the arcade game to play and record as a reference point, and nor does he remember any other assets given to him. But I'm guessing he might have been given the Commodore 64 version and some of the some of that's graphical assets, given how the sprites in the C64 and the CPC versions are near identical, and it also plays very similar to. Um, as for how it was coded, they had, and I directly quote from Sean, and this is quite long, they had a cross-development platform based on the Tatum Einstein, probably uh, originated from Ocean developer teams, and our own hardware and monitor program across to each platform. We could assemble and squirt straight to the target machine even whilst it was still running the code. The monitor controlled the transfer from the parallel printer port to the edge connectors or whatever I.O. was available and allowed us to break, debug, etc. All nice and quick and he goes on to say we had a standard library of routines for all the I.O., sprites, scrolling, etc. And unless a game needed something special, probably the scrolling Spy Hunter had some special optimizations, we could take our version from one platform and pretty much make it work in minutes on another. The graphics took more time, uh, but we had quick ways of converting between Z80 and 6502 and even up to 68000 for first stab at porting, then out optimizing. Uh, okay, and he also goes on to say, we would usually have access to original arcade, the original arcade game or another conversion, and in some cases where possible the original source code. I don't think we had much for Spy Hunter, which is probably why it was not such a good conversion. Oh look, we just moved to the next level, we're now in the uh, Icy Roads section. I'm going to continue on with what Sean was telling me, and i uh, continue to quote. To be honest, he says, I cannot recall that much about the uh, specific conversion. <clears throat> I think I recall it was knocked out in record time under great demand, possibly under a week. Wow. Um, this, this version was possibly done in under a week. Hmm. Um, and he says, I think I recall um, working an entire weekend with no sleep, displeasing the then girlfriend and now wife at the time. But, well, that happened a lot. <laughs> now, Sean does say he was aware of some bugs at the time. Um, as you can see, guys, there's a bullet from the Road King has now corrupted the um, heads up display at the bottom there, but that's probably the most minor bug in the game. We may see some more in a bit. Um, but um, it goes on to say, um, yes, he was aware of some bugs at the time, but then US Gold were, were responsible for quality assurance and bug testing. So they must have accepted it at the time, which is, um, as, as, as I'm now saying, not sure. It's quite typical of you as Cold, really. <laughs> he also wishes that Choice had decided to be paid in royalties rather than a fixed cost. He might have been a bit richer today. I think that is quite common with a lot of coders doing conversion work back in the day. Yeah, I think it was all pretty much fixed cost. Um, his final wish in ret retrospect would have been... Uh, access to the arcade version and had more time to make the gameplay and mapping more coherent with the uh, coin up. So there you go. That's pretty much what sh um, the gist of what Sean had to tell me. We've been chatting away about other bits and bobs. Uh, it's a shame I didn't have him to talk to when I did my Platoon uh, long play about a year or two ago because yeah, that, was, that, that was also one of his. But thank you very, very much, Sean, for having a good old chinwag with me and also popping in the Amstream on Friday to chat with the uh, Amstrad community and the Amstream crowd. Very, very nice of you. So, right, um, we're going to move on from that to talk about um, 
the other versions of the and other conversions of Spy Hunter, see how it kind of compares. Um, so we'll start with the uh, good old Specky, the ZX Spectrum. Now, firstly, the Specky version moves a fair bit faster and smoother than the CPC version. Uh, the controls are different, unlike the Amstrad, where there's a sense of uh, build-up and inertia when you're moving left and right. I think it's the same on the Commodore, actually. 64. Um, on the Specky, you literally move left or right immediately at the same pace for as long as you push the direction, which is probably closer to the arcade version, to be honest. Also, the handling of the weapons are different. To shoot anything, you have to hold down the fire, uh, the fire button, then push a direction, even for the machine guns. Um, and that will also lock the car or boat in the... Oh gosh, hang on. Can we get past this mine here? Ooh, go very, very slowly. The, if, you're on the, if you're hitting the edge of the road, the faster you're going, the more likely you are to spin off. So go very slowly there. So the specy version. So yes, when you're... For the weapons, you have to hold down the fire button and push a direction. Which will, which will mean that your car or boat will be locked in the current direction it's currently going in. So yeah, mm, makes it a bit tougher, I suppose. Uh, so pushing left will drop the smoke, pushing right for, for the oil, up and down for the machine guns or rocket if the copter is near. It takes some getting used to, but it kind of works actually. I also found myself playing this version for way longer than I expected to. Uh, it's easier than the Amstrad one and it's kind of fun. However, there's no Peter Gunn theme music at all whatsoever. The C64 version, um, I'm shocked actually. Um, the Amstrad version nicks all the sprites and a load of graphics from this. Um, go and check it out on YouTube after you've watched this vid. Um, it also plays very similar in terms of how enemies appear and behave. Um, there you go, a lot of similarities between the Amstrad and the C64 version. Um, I've spotted the odd, odd, sorry, bug here and there too, uh, but this is a very cool version of the arcade original and there's a brilliant Sid Chip rendition of the Peter Gunn music that's very similar sounding to the arcade version. Overall, I think the Commodore 64 version has the best feel and if you want to get that authentic arcade experience on an 8-bit computer. Uh, the rest of the uh, versions I've only taken a quick look at on YouTube, so you know, don't hate me if I've got something wrong here. The Atari 8-bit, um, like the Atari 800XL. Now this is a version I remember as a kid around my friend's house, I used to play it a lot. And it's weird, it's not as good as I remember. It's a decent port though, and often Atari 8-bit versions are comparable to the Commodore 64, but that isn't the case here, sadly. It's not quite as good. It has a decent speed, uh, but not as smooth as the C64. The music and graphics are good, but again, not quite as good as the Commodore, uh, but it's a decent conversion overall. Um, they also appeared on the Atari 2600. Uh, yep, even appeared on that, and not many people know it did. Uh, the music is nasty on it though, and the graphics, as you'd expect, are extremely basic. However, for the 2600, it's an excellent conversion and as faithful as is possible on the technology available. Oh look, we move to another area, and we're back in the desert again. Anyway, we'll carry on with um, the other versions. Uh, this also appeared on the BBC Micro. And digitised gun sound and speech on the title screen. I was like, that was a big wow from me. Uh, and that has the Peter Gun theme as the game starts too. As for the game itself, ugh, um, the graphics are horrible. It's not a good frame rate and car movement isn't nice and it's quite jittery. After such a good start, it's disappointing. But the sound and music is really good though. Um, last few versions then, getting a bit more obscure here with the Apple II, if you're from the UK anyway, or Europe. Um, it has very basic graphics on the Apple II, um, as you'd expect, and limited sound effects. Uh, it plays okay, but it's nothing to write home about. Um, Spy Hunter also um, appeared on the ColecoVision and it had great music, uh, pretty decent graphics and good gameplay, puts this miles ahead of the 2600 port and is very good overall. Uh, the NES, Nintendo Entertainment System, great music and plays really fast, looks really good fun but you can only hold either smoke or oil, otherwise it seems quite faithful for an NES port and pretty good. 
Um, also got an ex uh, sorry, the NES also got an exclusive sequel in Super Spy Hunter. And the last version to talk about is the MS DOS version. Probably the worst of all, the music is crap and it plays way too fast and has rubbish CGA graphics and is very, very basic. I think, guys, overall, of the home computer 8 bit versions, the Commodore 64 probably wins here quite easily. Um, Specky and Amstrad versions, they're okay. Um, I don't know which I prefer out the Specky or the Amstrad, to be honest. It's a tough one to call. Um, I remember having this as a kid, and I did spend a fair amount of time playing it. I, you know it's kind of basic and simple, and it's a bit rough around the edges, and there's bugs in the game. Uh, we'll come on to the bugs in a minute. Um, but I ended up playing it for quite a bit. An enjoyable game is an enjoyable game. However, it gets frustrating very quickly. Um, with sometimes some very unfair deaths as cars crash into you. There's not much you can do about it. But hey, the arcade original was extremely tough too. Um, as for bugs, there are some horrendous bugs in this game. Thankfully, we've not encountered them on the long play. Um, there's one with the weapons van where if it gets... When it appears on the screen, and if it gets bashed around too much, including your interceptor getting bashed around too much at the same time, and uh, the weapons van starts like basically jittering from left and right repeatedly and gets stuck like that and it's impossible to enter the weapons van. You just have to blow it up basically. Um, at times the weapons van refuses to appear if the helicopter's on screen. And you can sort of make it appear if you can slow yourself down, wait for the helicopter to just disappear or blow it up and then time it right moving on to a certain section of road. Um, the weapons van will only appear when you're at the widest point on the road, so it won't appear now that the road is too narrow for it. But when we come to a wider stretch of road, it might appear, like for example, maybe here coming up. That's why I'm slowing down there to see if I can actually get the weapons van spawned. So it's on those kind of stretch stretches of road where it's got that width there where a weapons van should appear but it doesn't if the helicopter is on the screen most of the time. Um, there are glitches where um, the van that drops your car off kind of gets stuck in the scenery and it unloads you into the scenery and you die and it will keep doing that repeat uh, over and over repeatedly. I've seen glitches where the cars spun off all the way over to the left side of the road and the sprite has glitched on the far left and the sprite is there stuck flashing away. Um, but generally you can actually continue on with the game. It's just a visual bug which looks nasty. Um, I think there are other bugs actually. I'm just trying to remember them now. Um, I don't think about the game crash. I have had it. Um, I, ha I have seen one instance of basically where I've crashed off the road but the weapons van hasn't spawned in and what's ha oh didn't mean to do that there what's happened is it's meant to um, move up further in the road and then spawn you but it gets stuck in a kind of a weird loop and I've basically gone through the entire game without being spawned and got to the end of the uh, first main loop and completed it essentially mm. a lot of bugs as for magazine reviews at the time, as always, I look for the review in the big Amstrad magazine of the time, which is Amstrad Action. Well, seeing, it, seeing as it was never released on full price, there's no review for that. As for review on the Kicks budget label, well, we have no idea when that was released. Um, so I'm not going to troll through every issue of Amstrad Action. But I did have a scan through quite a few issues around the 1989 period when Kicks was releasing its first budget titles, but didn't find one. Oh! There we go, guys. Actually, I think we have just completed the first loop of the game. And there we go. We're back to the uh, the, the green, um, grassy um, hills hills and fields or whatever of where we started. So there we go, guys. That is Spy Hunter completed. And we'll just crash a few times and um, get a game over. Um, as for my review, well... 
This might have squeezed a 7 out of 10 if I'm being very generous. There you go, that's what happens when you crash. Um, but yeah, 7 out of 10 if I'm being very generous. But, but the bugs really kill it. And with all the bugs I've just mentioned, and the controls I'm not a fan of, of how the car moves around the screen, it's too frustrating at times. Um, it's, it's missing the uh, Peter Gunn theme music. That would have made such a huge difference. So I'm going to give it a 6.5 out of 10, which is probably still quite generous, really. So, but, however, it's still fun for a quick blast, um, but only until the frustration takes over or the bugs prevent you progressing any further. Uh, talking of bugs, I've saved one for last for you guys. And as you can see there, guys, I should have spawned in. Where's the um, truck? Why has the helicopter gone to the far left of the screen there and has got stuck? Why aren't I spawning in? So the helicopter disappears here. Where's the uh, truck and van that drops me off? <laughs> and then the helicopter comes back. Very strange. And then it gets uh, goes over to the left side of the screen and get stuck there. So thankfully this bug occurred after we've essentially completed the game or at least one full loop of it. And we're, it'd be mad for us to go and do two loops of the game really. I think we've pretty much seen all we're gonna see. Um, and I'm still not spawning in. <laughs> and the uh, heads up display at the bottom there is still glitched. So, oh! Oh, my car's appeared on the far left of the screen there. And we appear to be stuck. Oh, 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 we've got a flashing glitching sprite there. So it spawned me in on the far left there. But now the, the van arrives and it's going to drop me off. But we're left with a uh, flashing glitch sprite there. <laughs> um, this is what happens when... Um, Publishers put stupid, ridiculous demands on programmers and their coding houses to like quickly do a get a uh, port done of a game and only give them a week to get it done. So, Sean, I'm not having to go at you, mate, or criticizing you. It is what it is. You have you can only do what you can do in the time allotted to you. Um, but it's always fun to have a little laugh at bugs and stuff like that. And uh, is it going to glitch here as well? No. So there we go. So there we go, guys. Thank you very, very much for watching. This this video was a lot of hard work making, actually. Uh, so I hope you do enjoy it and appreciate it. Many, many hours of work, this one. Thank you again to Sean Pierce for chatting to me. And um, yeah, we're just going to crash our last car here. And take you to the game over screen. Oh no, one more to go. <laughs> and my van crashes and blows up from the inside. Nice. Luckily, it doesn't actually kill you. So at least they tested that. One more crash. And then we get game over. So thank you very much for watching, guys. That's a six and a half out of ten. Once again, thank you to Sean Pierce for chatting to us. We're very lucky um, he uh, did that. Did that. I hope you found that interesting. Let me know in the comments below what your thoughts are and stuff like that. And I'll see you all again very soon. Goodbye. So thanks for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed that, if you did please click a like below, leave a comment and also subscribe if you haven't already and over that way there's another video for you to check out, Zypho out.